All right. So we're starting um, a new section in analysis. Well, basically, um, Ted started with the moisture, which is part of this section. Uh, but I would like to step back a little bit and introduce proximate analysis in general before moving into uh, the different components. So when we say proximate analysis, what do you get from that? What is proximate analysis? What do you think it is? Guesses. Yeah, there you go. So the proximate analysis is basically looking at the composition of food for the major components. So the major components are moisture, carbohydrate, protein, fat, and ash, which constitute mostly the minerals. Okay, but we call it proximate because the methods are really proximation. So they are mostly crude. Um, methods. That means determining the crude to total protein and the crude total fat because it's very hard to determine um, exact amount of protein and exact amount of fat because, for example, for fat you use different solvents and not there is not one solvent that can extract all the components that we label as fat. Um, or for protein, the official methods are based on nitrogen determination and we will learn that a protein is not the only source of nitrogen. So that's why we call it crude protein content, crude fat content, and that's why we call the whole thing proximate compositional analysis. So we approximate it. Okay. So we basically look at it at the composition as a pie. When we present the, the compositional data, oftentimes we present it a, in a pie format. And the pie would be divided into uh, those five main components. And we determine them as a percentage of the whole. And that's the whole is the 100%. So there's your moisture, depending on the sample, ash, fat, protein, carbohydrate. So carbohydrate protein, fat, ash, moisture. Obviously, it varies from different products, uh, from one product to the other. But all of these five components represent the whole. That's why it is all of this add to 100%. All right. So out of all of these components, OK, which of these components are on your label? Evan? Huh? Okay, total carbohydrate is on the label. What else is on the label out of these components? Lauren? Fat and protein. So you have the total fat. I'm going to change the battery really quick so that I can point. So the total fat, the total protein, and the total carbohydrate. So we don't see ash, we don't see moisture content. But all analyses are required for nutrition label. So. To produce a nutrition label, as you can see, as you will see as a capstone student, uh, either this semester or next, you will be determining all of all of these components. Why do you think we need to analyze everything, uh, although we only need to report three? Anybody has any idea, or those of you that are in capstone have any idea? No, huh? No idea. Oh, Alex has an idea. Mm 
What you are very close. You are right on track here. Carbohydrate is usually not determined experimentally for, for the nutrition label. It's determined by difference. So we determine moisture, ash, fat, protein, and because total carbohydrate is the most complex in terms of components, you have the fiber, you have starch, you have sugars, you have oligosaccharides, so there's not one method that can quantitate all of these different components. So it's even harder to get crude total carbohydrate than getting crude total protein and crude total fat. So because it is the hardest to amount or quantity or component to measure, we measure all four and we subtract from 100 to get total carbohydrate. And also we want to make sure that we don't measure them separately, then we don't get 100% back to Alex's point. We don't get 100%, we might get, if we in measure them individually, we might get 95% or 105%. We can't afford that. We need to make sure that all the components fits within the pie. So therefore, we measure those four and calculate total carbohydrate by difference. Okay, so for the nutrition labeling, we, we talked about having to uh, use official methods of analysis. So, and these are the methods that we're going to learn along with other methods for each component. So for moisture, all of you have done the labs already. We've done the, the AOAC method or the official methods of analysis are oven drying methods. Oh, Sam. Um, yeah, so I get that it's more complex to figure out what the total amount of carbohydrates in each product is going to be. Yeah. But if you're going to have to figure it out from the nutrition label, I mean, it's not going to have to figure out what the amount of fiber, sugar, ash, sugar, et cetera. Like, you don't add it up? Yeah, because in, uh, on the label, you do the total carbohydrate, uh, total dietary fiber, yes, total sugars, yes, and total uh, added sugars, but there's other components like oligosaccharides, for example, maltodextrin, for example. So they don't necessarily fall. Sometimes you, you won't be able to measure them in one particular method. So there's the starch as well, which you don't, you don't include, then you would want to add, you want to measure this, this, added sugar, and then do the total starch and do the oligosaccharides in order to add everything up. So carbohydrate is just a very complex, annoying component that we don't love at all. So I guess then the question is why aren't just like most things listed? Why is it just fiber, sugar, and starch? That's what you need to worry about? Oh, for the nutrition label? Oh, go ask the FDA that question. No. <laughs> But uh, yeah, people don't really care about how much starch you're consuming. They care how much dietary fiber you're consuming, given nutrition facts. We, they care about the dietary fiber. They care about how much sugar you're consuming. But they don't really care about how much oligosaccharides or starch you're consuming. Ugh. Something went. Frozen in my computer here. Okay, go. So, ash, we will talk about it today and run it in lab next week. The official method to determine and quantitate ash is dry ash and using the muffler furnace. And we'll talk about that later. Fat. Soxet and Mojina are uh, the methods that we're going to learn in lab next week. These uh, are good in determining crude fat, but really for the nutrition label, the fat content that we get here is not done by Soxet or Mojina, although they are official methods. The FDA requires FAME analysis. So they require fatty acid analysis to determine fatty acids all the way from those that are four, chain of four, C4, all the way to C24. So they quantitate all of those and then they, me they uh, measure them in terms of glycerides. So they add glycerol to, uh, to the calculations and then they get total fat that way. This is how the FDA requires that the total fat be uh, determined for the nutrition label. 
and you already done the fame analysis in lab. We didn't necessarily do it in the quantitative ma uh, manner. Uh, the only difference is when you do quantitative, you need to get different standards and do standard <coughs> curve, um, not just analyze um, the peak areas like you did in the lab. So protein next, we're going to learn about the DUMAS and the KELDAR, which are both methods based on nitrogen determination. We'll learn about these two methods. Either one is sufficient for nutrition label, and total carbohydrate, we already talked about that by difference. So that's basically 100% minus all of the percentage on wet basis to determine total carbohydrate on wet basis as is, that is. Okay, any question on proximate analysis? All right. So, moving on, now we're going, we already talked about moisture last week, now we're going to talk today about ash, Friday, uh, will cover fat, and next week, protein. Um, there is still one lecture that I skipped, which is the in the fluorescence absorption spectroscopy. I will um, back, go back to it next week, because I want to cover ash and fat this week for the lab. Um, and then I'll go back and finish the fluorescence um, spectroscopy lecture. Just make note of that. Okay, so. What is the definition of ash? When we say ash, what comes to mind? Evan? Yeah, yeah, so it's the minerals, but when you, I mean, what does the word ash mean? Where does it come from? Why do we call minerals ash? Stuff left after something is burned. Yes, thank you. And here's a little, I was, um, this is a very kind of simple lecture, and I just wanted to toy around with it. But basically, you put your sample in a crucible, and then you, in, you put it at a really high temperature, and then organic matter evaporates, your oxidizes into carbon dioxide mainly, and NO2, and NO whatever uh, number. And also, if you have sulfur in your protein, SO2. And of course, your vapor, your water vapor. So what is left behind is the ash. So that means everything organic has been burned off, and whatever inorganic matter left is your ash, and it's mostly your minerals. Why do we care about ash? Why do we do ash analysis, or why is it important? We just said one reason. Yes, that's one important reason. It's important to measure it so that it helps us calculate a percent total carbohydrate needed for the nutrition labeling. What else? Why did you ash your samples in the lab? Or why did we ash them for you? For what lab? Hold on. So for the lab, we ask them because then they would be able to identify us the way they do it, that they would do the study the way they do it, and they would have the results. Yes, for mineral analysis. So it's the preparatory step you need to do to analyze your minerals. You need to get rid of the organic matter so you can release the minerals from its interaction with organic matter so they can be measured, detected, and measured. So here we go. That's part of the uh, nutrition label. Oh, I forgot I had this here. Ha do you know Popeye? Popeye the sailor man. Boop, boop. Yeah. That. I used to love that as a kid. Spanish is high in iron. That's why he's very strong, if you did not know that. But. You don't know the, the cartoon, whenever he wants to be powerful, he breaks a s spinach can and eats it, and then he becomes the strongest man on earth? Yeah. Okay. All right. So sample preparation. 
So it depends on your uh, sample. So if your sample is really high in moisture content, you really want to pre-dry it first. You don't want to put milk in there. It will splatter all over at high temperature because incineration happens at 500 degrees C. And temperature sometimes rises faster than it can be controlled. So basically, drying for um, high moisture uh, foods like milk or plant material. And sometimes you need to do fat extraction. Say uh, cheese and meat are high in fat. So what can happen, especially in cheese, and you'll see that the cheese groups in the lab, that if you put the cheese sample in the muffin, uh, muffin furnace as is, what happens is the, the fat starts smoking. And part of that, in the smoking process, some of the material might just come off your crucible, and then you might lose some ash or mineral content with the smoking and burning. Uh, that might just start splattering out. So oftentimes, we defat if it's high in fat, and we dry if it's high in moisture. But in the lab for the cheeses, we are going to be they're going to be pre-dried, but however, for fat, we're not going to remove the fat. Instead, we're going to put them on hot plate, and then we'll let them slowly burn without splattering before we put them in the uh, muffle furnace. Um, you obviously need to uh, prepare your samples so that you, in you reduce particle size and increase surface area. So you're always going to make, reduce the particle by grinding. So milling and grinding. Um, but if your product is so wet or high in fat or um, sticky, what you usually do is, you know how you would grind such a product? Let's say you have a granola bar or some, a chewy bar, and you want to determine the ash content of that. Cryo yes, cryo-grinding. Um, so that means freeze it and grind it while frozen, either on ice yeah, or on dry ice or under nitrogen. So, um, but the problem with that is sometimes you get contamination, especially mineral contamination, depending on the container uh, that you put your sample in to grind, to grind it. So if it's metallic, then you're possibly going to get some uh, elemental contamination. So that is a possibility. So that down here is the issues with samples that are high in moisture and high in fat, and also sugar products that might cause foaming. So the problem, you can solve the problem. Again, foaming, you will lose sample if they start foaming in the muffle furnace. The way to solve that is either put your samples when the muffle furnace is cold and increase the temperature slowly so that you don't get a uh, large amount of foaming um, occurring. So you increase the temperature slowly and then control how fast the temperature goes up. Or you can preheat it on, um, like I said, the hot plate to get the fuming and if there is foaming to occur, but not too intensely, so that you don't lose product out of your crucible. So ashing methods, we have different types of forms of ashing. So dry ashing is often done when you really want to um, quantitate, when you want to determine an amount. Um, you can do dry ash ashing in a muffin furnace. You can do dry ashing in a microwave. But the microwave ashing is not yet a uh, fully uh, official method. They have compared it uh, to dry ashing, but it's not yet the official method of analysis. It's much faster in terms of uh, getting values, whereas dry ashing in a muffin furnace requires an overnight process. Microwave ashing requires uh, minutes. Uh, up to two hours of processing. So what ashing does not give you a weight for the ash, so you cannot really get a percentage of an ash, but you can 
you use it when you really want to determine mineral content without um, risking loss of volatiles. With dry ashing, you would lose some volatiles like the, uh, zinc or iron, for example. Whereas wet ashing, you are ashing using high con highly concentrated acids and lower temperatures. So you oxidize your organic matter, but you don't really lose your volatiles. So going to specifically to dry ashing, so um, you'll see the muffled furnace next week in lab. So it's basically a chamber, but you can uh, get the temperature to be really high, 500 to 900 degrees C. So it's a really high temperature. Um, and then you need a special container to put in your sample to, to ash it. So you cannot really use what you used in lab for moisture, those dishes, well, they will burn off. So you want to make sure you have a crucible that withstand 500 degrees and higher temperature. There are so many crucibles to choose from um, for ashing. This is what we have in the lab, which is porcelain. It is stable if your food is acidic, but if you have alkaline type of um, matrix, it's not stable in alkaline. It might disintegrate at high temperatures. So, but usually your foods are not alkaline, so either neutral or acidic, so that serves well. Uh, it's only problem, it might crack if temperature is rising pretty fast in your muffled furnace. But it's cheap, it's overall durable, and it's good when you're either teaching labs or uh, processing a lot of numbers of samples. So that's kind of the um, container that is most commonly used. Now there's quartz. Quartz is um, stable in acidic uh, foods, but not so much alkaline, same as porcelain, and actually withstand really high temperature. So it doesn't crack up to 900 degrees C. So it's very, very stable, but it's relatively expensive. So it's not the choice that you, one usually makes. Um, the steel is very stable to acid or alkaline um, and to high temperatures, but the problem with steel is what? From the name steel. Huh? Yeah, mineral contamination. So you get iron, nickel, and chromium um, in steel. So you don't want usually to ash if you're really in this, if you're really after looking for iron content. Um, quartz fiber uh, is similar to quartz, and the, the benefit is, first of all, it's disposable, but it's also very porous, so it allows for um, heat transfer quicker, and ashing occurs at um, faster time, or occurs faster than regular crucibles. Now, the last one here is platinum. It's the most stable and durable of all of them in terms of temperature and acid base and no contamination, obviously, but it is the most expensive and people usually don't, don't go with that um, because of how expensive it is. You cannot really um, use these when you have so many samples that you need to process daily. So some of the disadvantages and advantages of dry ashing, disadvantages, first of all, I mean, it's lengthy, so you have to wait a day. But, and initially it's expensive equipment, but once you obtain it, it stays, it lives many, many years. Uh, last, volatilization of some minerals. So if you're after determining iron, zinc, copper, phosphorus, you really don't want to do dry ashing. Um, it's not necessarily the method to go for de accurate determination. Um, because if you incinerate at low temperature, 450, 480, uh, the chance is that um, you won't oxidize all of your organic matter. 
So if you want to make sure that organic matter is oxidized and is, uh, is gone, you need to increase the temperature a little bit more. Otherwise, you will overestimate ash. But when you do that, you risk losing these minerals if you're after mineral determination. So you want to weigh out what do you want to do? Are you after mineral evaluation or are you after determining accurate ash content? So advantages is pretty, pretty safe if you put your samples when it's not hot and if you take them out after you cool it down. So there is not much to it and not attention. So you just put your samples and then turn it off and take your samples out, weigh them and that's it. No reagents or blanks are needed for determining just the ash content. And many samples can be analyzed at a time. So you can weigh out as many samples as your molten furnace can fit and then run them all at once. What can you anticipate in terms of sources of error in dry ashing? We talked about a few, but what can you anticipate? Come on, those of you that have not participated much. They're waking you up. Okay. I'm waiting. We just, I just said one just a minute ago. Jacob. Yeah, you lose volatiles in dry ashing. What else? I said another one. We have all the time in the world, technically. What happens to your uh, estimation of ash if your ash is black still? you get overestimation. And when your ash is black still, that means you have some organic matter yet that did not burn off. What else? Uh, okay. Sample not representative. This is actually an uh, error that can happen in any method of analysis. You can go wrong if you put this in any question I ask you. Sources of error in dry ashing, sources of error in moisture content, sources of error in fat evaluation, sources of error in anything. Your sample needs to be representative. Your, your sample needs to be homogenized and a homogeneous sample picked from the bulk for determination. Okay. Microelement contamination, this can come from your grinder, it can come from your storage container, it can come from um, the crucible itself if you're using steel. So yeah. Loss of sample in, in pre-preparatory step, whether it's drying in this case or defatting. So if you lose sample somehow in transfer, then that would cause issues with quantification. We talked about volatilization, incomplete combustion when your ash is black, you overestimate. So volatilization leads to underestimation, incomplete combustion leads to overestimation. Okay, take out a piece of paper for some extra credit, solving stuff in lab, in class. Make sure to write your name on it. So 
This second half of food analysis requires a lot of calculations. So you'll see that from everything we are going to cover from now on, there will be quite a bit of calculations. So for labs, you're going to be doing a lot of wet bases, dry bases, and going back and forth, especially next week you'll be converting dry to wet uh, for fat determination in cheeses. So it's good to know these equations. And why do we care about on dry basis? Because oftentimes when we are comparing samples for ash content or protein content out in industry, they don't want to, they don't care about the moisture. They want you to compare without the moisture because moisture can change uh, due to different reasons. So they want to know the exact content based on solids. So this is a common practice and that's why you're learning this. Anybody? Of at least how you're going to approach this? I don't see people trying. Some of you are not even trying. Come on. Yes, ma'am. Uh, when you take the wet basis over uh, 100 minus wet basis, how does that do? What is that basis? To 100 minus wet? No, so 1.14 over 100 minus 1.14? No, what you want to get is you want to get your weight of dry matter. So you want to get, because ash is a dry matter, so you want to get the percentage of ash of your dry matter. So what is your dry matter? Your dry matter is the whole minus, minus what? To get the dry matter? Moisture. So the whole, which is 100, minus the moisture will give you your dry matter. So the 1.14 in your dry matter, which is 53, in this case, right? 1.14 over 53 times 100 is your dry basis. Does that make sense? 2.15, yes. So basically, it's 1.14 over your whole minus the moisture content, which is 53. So 1.14 grams of ash over 53 grams of solid multiplied by 100 to get a percentage. So that is the percent of ash of your dry matter. Does that make sense? 